Welcome back once again to day 39 of our program, 50 Days with God. We take decisions every day. Small decisions, big decisions, life-altering decisions. But have we taken that solemn decision to live reconciled to Christ? Stay with us to discover and learn more about this topic entitled, God's Laundry. May the peace of the Lord be with all of you. Welcome to our set of lectures. And today's lecture is God's Landry. On August 29th of the year 70 AD, the Roman armies under the command of General Titus penetrated in the city of Jerusalem. The Jewish resistance was fierce, but could not stop the advance of the Roman troops. The savage slaughter perpetrated by the Romans made the blood of the Jews run like water on the streets. That day, the Temple of Jerusalem, the heart of the Jewish religion, the object of their pride, was set on fire until it was burned to ashes. The next day, the Roman soldiers realized that the gold that had coated the walls of the temple had been melted and was embedded all around on the fallen stones of the temple. The soldiers removed every one of those stones looking for that goal until nothing was left. The prophetical words of Jesus were fulfilled exactly as he predicted. Mark 13, 1 and 2 says, and as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Exactly as Jesus predicted, it happened. The place where people from all around the world could come to be cleansed from their sins existed no more. The place where sinners could bring their sacrifices to be washed of their spiritual uncleanness had been destroyed for good. And uh, nowadays is almost 2,000 years of that catastrophe for the Jewish people. Well, it's interesting that that was announced by Prophet Daniel around 600 years before the event took place. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, it says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the world desolations are determined. Here is a clear description of what happened at that time. At the same time, and closely related to this prophecy, other vision was given to Daniel. I repeat, the revelation about the destruction of the temple and the end of all the ritual services performed in that temple uh, was given. Other revelation was also given to the prophet, Daniel 8, 14. It says, And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This is the point. On one side, the prophecy about the destruction of the temple was given. And on the other prophecy, is mentioned that 
After 2,300 days, the sanctuary was to be cleansed. To understand the dramatic meaning of these events, we must trust on the Word of God first, and then turn to the sanctuary service to understand the meaning of those services and the prophetical meaning of those words given or the revelations given to prophet Daniel. After the fall of Adam and Eve, God provided a temporal and a provisional way to solve the problem of sin among men. That is, Jesus had promised a solution for humanity after Adam and Eve fall in sin. But before his coming, a solution was necessary. So that's why a temporal and a provisional mean was established to find a way of salvation for humanity. In that case, the Lord established the services of sacrifices and offerings, meaning and representing the Messiah that was to be sacrificed for humanity. For that, the sinner had to provide a substitute. He had to bring an innocent victim to be slain instead of the guilty sinner. That was done in the sanctuary. Whenever a person committed a sin, he had to bring a goat or a sheep. There on the sanctuary, in the courtyard of the sanctuary, he had to put his hands upon the victim and confess his sins on the victim's head. And symbolica, symbolically, he was passing his sins, his guilt to the victim. Okay, that was the substitute. The victim was slain, was sacrificed instead of the real sinner, and the man was forgiven. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 4, 27 to 29, we may read, And if any man of the common people sin through ignorance, while he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and be guilty, or if his sin, which he had sent, come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a female without blemish, for his sin which he had sent. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering, and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. That was the instruction given by the Lord himself how to find a solution for human's guilt, for human sin. The sins of the guilty people now are on the victim. And through the victim, the sin was passed to the sanctuary because part of the blood was put on the horns of the altar of sacrifice and the victim was eaten by the priest and when the priest came into the sanctuary he brought the guilt of the sinner into the sanctuary in that way the sin of the guilty person was transferred from him to the sanctuary that was the way the lord established for liberating men from sin on the Day of Atonement, the sanctuary was cleansed of all of those accumulated sins that had remained there for all along the year. <clears throat> In the book of Leviticus 16, 15 and 16, we may read, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat, and shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation, 
that remaineth among them in the midst of the uncleanness. And verse 19 says, And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times, and cleanse it, and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. That was what was performed in the day of atonement. The sins that have been transferred to the sanctuary through the blood and the meat of the victim was now blotted out by that special sacrifice offered in that day, the day of atonement. Okay, in that way, the records that existed in the sanctuary about the sins of the people were eliminated. Well, all of that was symbolic. And uh, all of that is interesting because when we read in Daniel 8.14 that, as it is written, And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So it is a clear reference to the Day of Atonement. The sanctuary shall be cleansed. And there was, I repeat again, only one day in which that service was performed. That is, on the tenth day of the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar, when the Day of Atonement, with their ritual offer that day, made a full cleansing of the sanctuary. That was a blotting out of all the records of sin and the beginning of a new period. They began with no guilt in their records. All right. Based on the biblical principle that a prophetical day is equivalent to a literal year, it is written in the Bible, let's see that in Numbers 14.34, after the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. So, each day for a year. That is the prophetical principle. When we speak about 2300 days, it actually means 2300 years. The prophetical days are literal years. All right? So, with that in mind, we may go forward. In the book of Hebrews, we find that the earthly sanctuary was a copy of the heavenly sanctuary. That is, Moses built it or built the earthly sanctuary after the pattern shown to him of the heavenly sanctuary. Well, actually, it is in, in uh, Old Testament too, but in the book of Hebrews, it is specifically mentioned about that. Okay, that means that we have a sanctuary in heaven. And if there is a sanctuary, there is a priest. And if there is a priest, there is an office of intercession for humanity in heaven. Let's see that in the book of Hebrews chapter 8 verse 2. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and no man. Okay, a true tabernacle, a true sanctuary exists in heaven. And I repeat, if there is a sanctuary, there must be a service in that sanctuary as well. Let's see now Hebrews 9:24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, that is, in the earthly sanctuary, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So, according to Hebrews, Jesus, when ascended from this earth, he went to mediate, to intercede, to perform his ministry as a high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. And there, Jesus is performing that service. Therefore, there must be a time when the heavenly sanctuary must be cleansed, as the earthly sanctuary was cleansed. The prophecy about the cleansing of the sanctuary is a 
a revelation about the time when the judgment would begin in the heavenly court. In the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 9 to 10, we find a beautiful and an impressive prophecy. Let's see that. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as the snow, and the hair of his head like a pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Interesting. What is written in those books? And what is that judgment about? Who is going to be judged? If the vision is given to Daniel, obviously that judgment is for us. The 2300 years prophecy is pointing out to the time when this judgment would start. The angel Gabriel gave Daniel the beginning time when those 2300 years were to begin. When those, when those years was to, were to start, then we may count from that time and we may get the end of time. At the end of those days, the cleansing of, those, of the sanctuary would take place. Keep in mind, don't forget that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the blotting out of the records that were kept there of the sins of the people of Israel. So in the heavenly sanctuary, there is an atonement day as well. And the high priest is going to perform a similar service, a blotting out of the records kept there. And in this vision of Daniel, the records are presented. Those books have the records of human sins in there. Yes. Daniel 9.25 presents to us exactly the time when those 2300 years were to begin. Let's see. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troubled times. So the angel told Daniel that Since the time when the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, then that be the time when those 2300 years would be running to its fulfillment, to its end. Out of those 2300 years, the Lord said that He would reserve, He would give to the nation of Israel 70 weeks of years, that is 490 years, like a time of probation for them. And that was fulfilled exactly. Our time doesn't give us the uh, opportunity to explain about that. But the fact is that that is what Gabriel is telling Daniel. Okay, the point to begin the prophecy is the moment when the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem is given. Okay, based on the report given by Ezra in the seventh chapter of his book, the decree to restore Jerusalem was given by King Artaxerxes, king of Middle Prussia, and he gave that commandment, that uh, decree, on the seventh day of his reign. 
In the seventh day of his reign, Artaxerxes gave a letter to Ezra where he granted to the Jews uh, not only power to restore this, the sanctuary, the temple, to rebuild it, but to make the priests and officers of the sanctuary free from taxation. Second, they were to establish rulers from their own people and judges from their own people. So they have religious freedom. They have a legislation of on themselves. That is the power of, uh, you know, to judge themselves according to their own rules and some political forms of government. A restoration of the nation, that is the decree. And historically, the seventh year of actor sex is corresponds to the year 457 BC, that is before Christ. I repeat, the seventh year of the kings of their, the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Medo-Persia, is corresponding to the seventh year, I mean to the year 457 BC. So beginning in that year, 457 BC, the 2300 years take us to the year 1844 AD. That is Anadomini, after the Lord Jesus. So I repeat, beginning in 457 before Christ, the 2300 years takes us to the year 1844. That was the year when the heavenly sanctuary had to be cleansed according to the prophecy of Daniel 8.14. And... As a matter of fact, that year passed from the most, I mean from the holy place to the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary to begin with that service of cleansing, washing the heavenly sanctuary. The day of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary. The high priest was blotting out all the records that were kept there in heaven. Remember, in the vision Daniel had about the judgment, he mentions the books that were opened. And those books contains the records of our sins, of our lives there. Now, the Day of Atonement was a day of cleansing, erasing, blotting out the records of sin. And that is what is happening since 1844. So that interesting prophecy began at that time. 1844 is the, eight, is the year when it finished. Beginning in 457 BC, the prophecy takes us to the year 1844 and that is the time when Jesus would pass from the holy to the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary to start that service of blotting out the records of sin that were kept there. In conclusion, we may say that definitely in 1844 Christ began his ministry in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary to complete the blotting out of all the records of sin written in those books in heaven. That is the beginning of the judgment day because the day of atonement is equivalent to judgment because that is the time when every life will be examined carefully in detail to determine if those sins have been definitely a matter of repentance or not. And the blotting out of all the records implies the elimination of those records in heaven to erase from the universe the memories 
of the sins committed, committed by those that repented of sin. That time is already running, the time of the heavenly day of atonement. In our next lecture, we are going to see how it is done, what is happening there now in the heavenly court, where those books are examined and when your life is going to be called to be examined in detail. Be ready, because it's time to face the judgment of your own life. It's a time to be really serious about these realities. May the Lord help us, may the Lord bless us to be found free from guilt, to be found that we had repented of all of our sins. Be ready to meet your Lord, because the time is short. May the Lord bless all of us. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Let us take this important decision today and give our lives to God every day. What an important and interesting topic. If you join us again next time in the next video, we will have another important message that we can all listen to and take to heart entitled Preparation for End Times. Continue joining us throughout this program and as well the rest of these days that are remaining in the 50 Days with God series. Hi friends, hopefully you've enjoyed tonight's program so far and now we're going to switch gears for a moment. We're going to learn how to continue to care for our health. And so today's topic is entitled how to make, I'm going to change it, how to make and eat or choose healthy bread. But to begin with, before we focus on bread, we need to focus on our meal in general. So it's always important for us to consider a balanced meal, a balanced meal that contains half a plate of vegetables or fruits, a quarter of the plate with grains, and a quarter of the plate with sources of protein. So that would be um, nuts and seeds, legumes, beans, um, also tofu, it could also be seitan, gluten, and lots of yummy um, plant-based sources. So we recommend the plant-based diet because it is anti-inflammatory, it is healing, and it promotes health. It promotes, um, it, it is a diet that promotes fighting disease. So when we think of grains, grains are probably the biggest source of carbohydrates that we consume. And carbohydrates are actually very important for us because they are the source of energy for our body. Our body prefers carbohydrates for energy and especially our brain. Our brain needs glucose to function well, and glucose will come from carbohydrates. But it is excellent when we can consume whole grains. And so that's because whole grains have many benefits. One of them is it, is a, it has a high fiber content, and people are recommended to eat 25 to 40 grams of fiber per day. The average person doesn't reach that much on a processed standard diet, but if it is plant-based and if you're including whole grains, then it is simple to be able to reach that amount. There are two types of fiber, insoluble fiber, that is going to help with digestion. It's going to clean out your bowels, and then you have, it's gonna help you fight constipation. And then you have soluble fiber, which is gonna help you pull cholesterol out of your body, among other benefits. It's gonna help protect your mucus layers in your organs, and both of them are good for you. So there are some vitamins found in whole grains that includes vitamin, the B vitamins. It also includes minerals like iron, magnesium, and selenium. Why should I choose whole grains? So we already went over some of the benefits, but whole grains also have a lower glycemic index. And if you don't know what that means, basically that when your body digests it, when it processes it, the, when it processes the carbohydrates, Depending on the type of carbohydrate, it might spike your blood sugar and then come down, or it might slowly go up and slowly come down. That means that the, the glucose will be released really slower into the cells, but it will give you a steady stream of energy. It will keep you full longer. And so whole grains are good because they have a lower glycemic index. That means it's going to give you energy for a longer time. You're going to stay full for a longer time. Um, when you have the whole grain, it has three parts. It has the endosperm, which is the starchy part that is found in white flour, white 
bread as well. Then you also have the germ. The germ has beneficial oils. And then you have the bran. The bran is actually the outer layer. It is, is usually removed in white flour, white grains, but it is actually probably the best part because it is what contains the vitamins, the minerals, the enzymes, the oils, and the proteins. So when you can have the bran, when you can have the whole grain, you get the whole package, all of the benefits. So let me tell you some interesting facts about, gra about bread before we begin to talk a little bit more about bread. So bread is one of the most common sources of grains in many cultures around the world. Germany is the number one consumer of bread, and I notice from personal experience. And then Chile is actually number two, so that was interesting. Um, Americans tend to consume about 53 pounds a year of bread, or that's 24 kilos. In Russia, bread and salt are a symbol of welcome. So it is used in hospitality as well. The longest bread loaf ever baked was 1.3 kilometers long. That is quite long. Not sure who they serve that to. Um, another interesting fact is that the word companion comes from the Greek words com, meaning with, and panis, meaning bread. Therefore, it means the one you share your bread with. The companion is the one you share your bread with. Bread is actually mentioned 492 times in the Bible, so it's very much of the Bible diet. And then the average slice of bread has about one gram of fat and about 50 to 80 calories. So what can you do to make sure that the bread that you eat has the most benefits, is the best for you? So I'm gonna focus on two things. One is if you buy bread, these are things to keep in mind. And two, if you make bread, which is awesome, which is amazing, um, here are the benefits and here's why you should consider it. So first, if you buy bread, try to go for whole grain. So maybe your taste is not used to it, it will adjust to it, but go for whole grain. That If it says whole grain or whole wheat, that is going to be whole grain. That's going to include the three parts, the endosperm, the germ, and the bran. And you're not going to go for wheat bread. Those are all names that don't mean, don't necessarily mean whole wheat. Also 12 grain, multigrain, those don't necessarily mean whole wheat. Go for whole wheat bread. If you check the list of ingredients, try to read it and see if you're able to read it. Many breads have preservative, including propionic and benzoic acid, potassium bromate, um, azetylcarbonamide, and some of these are associated with cancers, with other things, and that means they're also going to be on the shelf a lot longer. It's not going to be very fresh bread. Also try to avoid the list of ingredients, hydrogenated oils, sugars, caramel food coloring, and high fructose corn syrup in bread. Um, also sugar. You don't really need sugar in bread. Then look at look at how it looks. Does it look dense? Does it look, or do, can you see grains on top? The ones that are dense and that have grains on top are going to be more beneficial. Um, that means they're going to have more fiber. So that is good for you. And then go for your taste. See what you like that can help you. So consider maybe some seeds, consider maybe some added different grains like millet or flax um, seeds and if you want to get a really good bread I recommend Ezekiel bread. Ezekiel bread actually comes from a recipe from the Bible and it is a very complex carbohydrate that means whole um, whole sources of grains it is a very beneficial bread. Now if you want to make homemade bread I congratulate you that is excellent because you know exactly what is going into that bread recipe it is always better because you have no preservatives, you are the creator, you can use your creativity, you can cater it to your likes, and it is actually quite simple. It is just a process and you try to learn it the first couple of times, and then it is really simple to make. When I make bread, I don't even use a recipe anymore, and um, yeah, you get used to it and you enjoy fresh homemade bread. It smells so good in the house. So the starting base for making bread is four ingredients that includes flour, salt, water, and dry yeast. You can also add a little bit of oil, plant-based oils, olive oil, example, to add a nicer texture, a smoother texture, and honey or a little bit of brown sugar just to grow the yeast, just so the yeast growth can be more, bene yeah, better. Basically, um, yeast feeds off of sugar, feeds off of carbohydrates, so you're going to make the yeast grow faster. Let me just give you a simple recipe, um, just so you have one, and you can try this one out. 
as I said, when I make bread at home, I eyeball it. So, <laughs> you can try all eyeballing it after a couple of times. But you're gonna use four cups of whole wheat flour, one packet or about one tablespoon of instant yeast, half a teaspoon of salt, about two teaspoons of honey or brown sugar, two cups of warm water. Make sure it is warm, make sure it is not cold, but also not hot. If it is too cold, it's not gonna activate the yeast. If it is too hot, it's gonna kill the yeast. So make sure it's lukewarm water. Then, what are you going to do? So you're gonna add the flour to the mixing bowl with the yeast and the salt, and you're going to mix it together. So basically, all the dry ingredients. Um, at the same time, or before, you're going to dissolve the honey or the brown sugar with a little bit of warm water, and you're gonna add that to the dry ingredients. And then you mix it, you don't need it yet, until you have a sticky and well combined dough. Then you're gonna transfer it to your pan, to your bread pan, and make sure that either you oil the bottom or you line it with parchment paper, just to make sure that it is, does not stick to your pan so you can actually eat it. Then you cover it, and you let it rise for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, depending. Make sure it's nice and fluffy. While the dough is rising, preheat the oven to about 390 degrees Fahrenheit or 200 degrees Celsius. And after that time, when you see this risen, bake it in the oven for about 40 minutes. So when you are making bread, what are some things to keep in mind? Some of them are gonna be very similar to the, if you choose to buy bread, but try to use, once again, at least half of the portion of flour, um, whole wheat flour, or make all of it whole wheat flour. Um, bread is great when it's homemade, even when it's whole wheat. Use seeds and nuts and anything that makes it tastier and more nutritious. Some examples are flax seeds, which have excellent sources of omega-3 fats, which are good for your brain, good for fighting inflammation. Chia seeds, which also have omega-3 oils and fiber. Hemp seeds are high in protein. Sesame seeds have calcium. Um, they're great for hormonal health and, and they're anti-inflammatory. Pumpkin seeds, for example, that includes phosphorus, omega-6 fats, um, phytosterols, which help reduce cholesterol, and then, for example, also sunflower seeds that contains protein and vitamin E. Another type of bread that you can make, you can look up some recipes online. It's gonna be a little bit of a longer process, but for some people they prefer is sourdough bread. And sourdough bread is somewhat more complex, but when you eat it, it is a little bit gentler for your body because um, the process of sourdough making, it already digests some of the carbohydrates. Um, remember that I mentioned Ezekiel bread for those who buy bread? Well, here's the recipe. I'm going to read it straight from the Bible. It is found in Ezekiel 4 9. It says, Take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and spelt, put them in a storage jar, and use them to make bread for yourself. You are to eat it during the 390 days that you lie on your side. So during this time, this was Ezekiel's main source of carbohydrates, most likely. Um, and you can see that this recipe included not only the grain, but also seeds. It also included a variety of grains, and that's a great example for us in your bread recipe. So that gives you some more ideas. Um, and then when you eat the bread, some topping ideas. You can put on hummus for a source of protein, nut butters, and then top it. Don't just leave it with a spread. Top it with fruits, with vegetables, with seeds. There are many, many options. And there you have it, Dad. Those are my tips for choosing or making a healthy bread. And for recipes, there are tons of recipes online. You can Google it, you can YouTube it, you can look up five ingredient breads or 20 minute whole grain bread recipe. Or if you wanna go fancy, sourdough bread recipe, how do you make it? Um, but yeah, look it up, there are many resources. But I wanna close with Bible verse from John 6 verse 35, it says, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So just like so many cultures around the world eat bread on a daily, on a weekly basis, and they need it, Jesus Christ says, look, I am the bread of life. You need me also to be healthy, to grow, to thrive. So I encourage you to remember that. And the next time you eat bread, you make bread, I encourage you to go for the healthier choices. I hope these tips are helpful to you.
eating processed foods or pre-made foods is of, of normal occurrence these days, but as we've seen today, making homemade foods is a lot better and healthier for us to do. Yes, let's try and make our own bread as shown today and eat less processed foods. We wait you in the next video for another important, very important message on sugar, a secret killer. We hope to see you there.